I want to read Psalm 119, verses 153 to 160. Look on my affliction and deliver me, for I do not forget your law. Plead my cause and redeem me. Give me life according to your promise. Salvation is far from the wicked, for they do not seek your statutes. Great is your mercy, O Lord. Give me life according to your rules. Many are my persecutors and my adversaries, but I do not swerve from your testimonies. I look at the faithless with disgust because they do not keep your commands. Consider how I love your precepts. Give me life according to your steadfast love. The sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous rules endures forever. What we've learned from John's gospel so far is that regeneration is made a reality when a person hears the gospel, when the word of God gives a person new spiritual life. And as Christ followers, we know that his word continues to give us life. It nourishes our souls like food. It testifies to us about Jesus. It satisfies us in the deepest part of our beings. How often we neglect the life-giving word of God. And in a sense, we're turning away, not even so much from the word, but what, what it is that Jesus has to say to us. That he wants to speak through his word. And when we neglect it, what we're saying isn't, isn't just, I'm not going to read my Bible, but rather, I don't want to hear what he has to say. And I'm going to turn away from what he would have to say. Maybe we would say we're too busy. It's not important enough. I mean, we wouldn't say that second one, though. We'd, we'd frame it and couch it in something a little more a little more sanctified and justified, but we're too busy, or it's not important, or we say it really has no effect. I mean, I read it, and it's not like I'm becoming more holy and more righteous by reading it. Or maybe, like the example in our passage, we know that the word is difficult. We know it's tough. We know it's going to say stuff that we don't understand or we don't like, and so we would rather avoid it altogether sometimes. The fact of the matter is this, and, and this is the question that Peter raises. Where else are we going to go? What's the alternative to hearing and receiving and submitting ourselves to the life-giving word of Christ? What's the other option? Jesus has the words that give eternal life, even now. Not just the words that save us someday when we stand before God at the judgment, but now. Eternal life experienced now by those who've been born again and whose citizenship is in heaven. Jesus has the words that give eternal life. Now, if you remember from last week, Jesus told everyone who was there listening, thousands of disciples, that unless they eat his flesh and drink his blood, they'll never have eternal life. And it seems rather graphic, and indeed it is a rather graphic picture Right, a symbolism by using his flesh and his blood. But we saw what Jesus meant when he said eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And we understand that what he really means is what he said earlier in this discourse, the idea of seeing and believing on the Son. And this is the one who has eternal life who will be raised up on the last day. That's what it means to eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of God. To see and believe to internalize, to have him very much a part of our lives at the core of our beings. But he used this, what was to the people, offensive and graphic language. And so with that in mind, this is why we have the response starting in verse 60. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? So this is difficult, and what's difficult is not the comprehending of his statements. It's not like Jesus said that, and, and they're saying, I don't, 
I don't understand. What do those words mean? I don't. What's the syntax? The issue isn't so much comprehending his statements, but actually believing if what he's saying is true, that's difficult. It's difficult. Does he really mean? Is he really calling for some form of cannibalism? Or if he is speaking metaphorically, what on earth is he talking about? That's the difficulty. If we're supposed to take him literally, that's a problem. But if we're supposed to take it metaphorically, that's also a problem because you have no idea what he's talking about. A apparently they missed the fact that, you know, two minutes prior he said that seeing and believing is how eternal life is given and he'll raise you up on the last day. They didn't make that connection. And so they're totally confused by it. Sometimes, sometimes the word of God can be tough to hear. Sometimes the word of, words of Christ create a similar response in us where we would say, if that really means what it says, then that's difficult and I don't like that. Or we'll say, okay, maybe it doesn't mean what it actually says so literally. Maybe there's a little work that needs to be done to understanding. Maybe it's a portion of the scriptures that's poetry or prophetic apocalyptic literature. But then we have a problem as well, which, well, what does it mean? And what is it saying about God, about me, about humanity? It's difficult. But the most difficult thing about the word of God isn't trying to decipher interpretation. And the most difficult thing about the word of God isn't trying to recognize, is it poetry? Is it apocalyptic? Is it prophecy? The most difficult thing about the word of God is that it exposes our sins and it lays us bare before ourselves. And the word of God by design reveals our true intentions. What's really going on in your heart and in your mind is exposed for you to see and ultimately for God who knows already when we allow his word to really penetrate, when we allow the scriptures to read us as we're reading the scriptures. And it can hurt. And God has designed it to operate that way. He's designed it to be, in the spiritual sense, painful and uncomfortable. Sanctification hurts. The daily dying to self hurts. And it's not easy. But we know what God is after, don't we? He's after abundant life. He's after us more and more bearing the image of Christ. He's after our good. He's after his glory. And God in his wisdom and in his mercy has designed his word to accomplish these things through the painful processes of discipline and sanctification.